Come in. Hello, Keith. Hello, Hello Keith. Keith. Oh, mm. Hello, Team 32. Keith, why is there a dolphin in your fish tank? He's helping me meditate. Oh, mm. And why does this place smell of Amazonian tree iguanas? Good spot, Laszlo. It's aggressive aromatherapy. Stench is a powerful motivator. That's why we won the First World War. Oh, mm. I am completely at one with my desk. Put a shirt on, Keith. You're frightening the dolphin. He's fine with it. These are all vital components of the department's new productivity drive, and it's given my productivity the boost up the backside it frankly didn't need. Watch this file. And that's in order of font size, losers. Oh, that's impressive. Good hand speed. What have you got for us today, then, Dalai Keith? The department committee wants a research brainstorm from you on tax and public spending, and in particular whether the welfare state is a gold medal or an unplaced albatross around the Treasury's neck. So you'd better get productive, and productivise like your jobs depend on it. Which, incidentally, they might. In the department's productivity league, the only team below you were the martyrdom experimentation unit. Oh dear. They died 16 years ago. Yes, they did. So you'll be circumnavigating a globe of trouble unless you increase your output by at least 250% by six. By when I also require your report on my desk by. Pick up the brief from the dolphin on your way out. Um, does he bite? No, he doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> Good boy, Wesley. <laughs> um, briefing meeting terminated. The department, far from the gaze of an unsuspecting public and untouched by the tentacles of Westminster, the department has been secretly running the country since, look, I would tell you, but then you'd have to kill me. Deep within its labyrinthine headquarters works a dedicated three-man think tank. Oscar Proud, binge historian and carrion hungry culture vulture. Victor Gooch, who grasps the firework of law and aims it towards his face. And Laszlo Wolf, scientific desperado and two-time European bicycle dressage champion. Each week, they are required to investigate possible solutions to one of the nation's major problems. Each week, your future is in their hands. Oscar, in what way will being forced to have a Roman bath before starting work help us to achieve minimum acceptable work rate? Ah, well, the department's productivity cone had spotted that the Roman Empire was the most productive franchise the world has ever seen. Well, at least until they started feeling attracted to horses and drinking lead. Don't knock it till you tried it, prude. And is this rat pasty a genuinely authentic Roman breakfast? Caesar's favourite. <laughs> Prefer this salad. So, we might as well plunge in and have a glance at our laminated brief. Oh, 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 cold. It says here that the tax and public spending barbecue was fizzling down to its last embers until Karl Marx threw his inflammatory sausage on it by craning in big letters from each according to his ability to each according to his needs. Don't remember that bit. Well, he buried it in the Communist Manifesto, somewhere in between the bits about parading tanks through Red Square and pumping athletes full of steroids. Well, ever since then, Britain has been having a conscientious tug of war with itself over whether or not public spending is the kind of institutionalised compassion that, like vegetarianism, crop tops, Mohicans and writing poetry, you really should grow out of. Yeah, right, it's that level of thinking which explains why our abysmal team productivity record is tempting Norris McWhirter out of his grey ah. Well, we'd better soak on that for a couple of hours and then get straight back to the office. Laszlo, could you do my back? It would be an honour. Here's my Roman duck. Attention, department employees. For veterinary research lab 12, who are currently looking for an animal to dissect... And for Dog Handling Squadron 1A, who have lost Rover, we have good and bad news, respectively. And that is why I am still undisputed department arm wrestling champion. I'll get this. Victor, the arm you wrestled was made of plastic and not attached to anyone. Yeah, well, it still had no answer to my belly splash off the top turnbuckle. Victor, that was one-armed Matilda from Accounts. She wants her arm back. Easy! Easy! Stop waving your belt around and focus. Right, now the brief says that the first pointy rhino we need to blunt is the fact that Britain as a nation congenitally hates paying tax. It makes our wallets go blotchy. What people resent most of all is hemorrhaging wadges of their income to the government without receiving so much as a tacky postcard from its holidays. Having a wonderful time in Afghanistan? Wish you were here. Oh, that's nice. I'll put it on the fridge. Is that too much to ask? No. In fact, it's not enough. It's time for the government to learn some manners and start zooming around the country delivering personal thank yous to every single taxpayer. Mrs. Nork at number 39, please come to your front door. Mrs. Valerie Nork? Yes? 
I am the junior finance minister, and on behalf of everyone at the British government, I'd like to thank you very much for your income tax. That's nice! Oh, can you back your chopper up? You've broken our porcelain oven, Parma! This year, we've spent 52% of your contribution provoking hostility around the world. Oh, fair enough. I suppose destabilizing volatile regions isn't a cheap hobby anymore. Uh, no, sundry other expenses included uh, funding the new royal canoe. About time, too. The Queen can't be expected to negotiate rapids in a civilian vessel. Uh, and the remaining 75 pence went on overseas development. I'm just glad I could help. Thank you, Mrs. North. You may return inside now. See you next year. Mr. Fuga, number 41. Please come to your front door. Mayday! Mayday! Junior Fuggers Minister! Mayday! Thanks for throwing my money away on primary school! My kids are in bed teens! It would be a lovely gesture. I'm not paying for those helicopters. Don't worry, we'll borrow them off the Portuguese. They grow on trees out there. You're thinking of oranges. My mistake. If we really want taxpaying to become as popular as other activities, like football and eating, we'll need to introduce people to the idea of tax when they're young and impressionable. Under my new Tax for Kids initiative, there'll be a special collecting frog in every sweet shop in the country, into whose mouth children will have to put 23% of their packets of sweets. Right. So, if they buy one of those bigger bags of sweets, presumably they'll have to put 40% in. Exactly. And if they buy enough sweets, they can just shove them all into a rucksack and walk straight out, no questions asked. It'll wean them onto the way the system works. Excellent. But children do still represent an unacceptable gamble for the state. That's true. So, we need to calculate how great a financial risk a child poses to the nation before it even deigns to swan out of the womb and begin suckling on the sagging, withered pap of public resources. Well, we've already got the personnel to do that. Fortune tellers. Fortune tellers? Yep. Like South American wingers, they're great entertainers, but they've got no end product. But if we absorb them into the civil service, they could function as an early warning system to predict a child's lifetime cost to the state. Hello, my dear. I see from your eyes that you are heavily pregnant. Yes. I need you to do a risk assessment on my prospective baby. Very well. Sit down. Before I begin, this is my colleague from the Treasury, the incredible auditing Nigel. Hello. Uh, I'll be calculating your child's impact on the public purse based on Madame Zuby Zaretta's visions, OK? That's fine. Good. I will place my hand on your belly, fat with kid. I see... a girl! Oh, bad start. Oh, potential maternity leave and far lower earnings than the boy your husband undoubtedly wanted. Will she be successful? I am not feeling the sharpest lemon in the box. I see her leaving the school at 16. Oh, that's short-term good news. I'm not seeing spectacular employment prospects. Oh, dear. So, statistically, she is likely to be having many children. And you'll be expecting the state to educate them, will you? <laughs> well, I'm going to have to swap hands. So what's the total, incredible auditing, Nigel? Over the course of her lifetime, your incoming daughter will cost this nation the region of... £800,000. Oh, dear. We're going to need that money from you before we can clear you to give birth. Uh, so, uh, what's it to be? 25-year gestation period or Mastercard? Oh, I'll get me handbag. I see a card being rejected. Thanks for the heads up, Angela. I'm not sure, Laszlo. Unborn babies could suffer the fate of university students. Before they even graduate from the womb, they're going to be saddled with lifelong debts they've got no hope of repaying without abandoning their dreams and becoming lap dancers or computer programmers. Well, maybe we can learn from university admissions. Your entitlement to use public services should depend on a trumped-up CV and a condescending interview. No way! You'll have bleeding cyclists lying on roads trying to convince unimpressed paramedics that they do voluntary work for the local donkey-fighting charity and how it's always been their dream dream to ride in an ambulance. Yeah, and why should I be subsidising inept cyclists to be trowelled off the tarmac? Well, the fact is people don't like being forced to pay for things they deem unnecessary luxuries, like dialysis machines their kidneys clearly don't yet need, and Scotland. Look, this headless goose of an issue is easily strangled. We simply need to use the pay-as-you-go system, which has proved so very effective at addicting children to mobile phone radiation. This would enable individual members of the public to choose exactly what their tax is spent on and when. 
Scalpel, please, nurse. Ah, this looks more complicated than we thought. Uh, nurse, how's his tax account looking? Oh, it's not very good. He's clean out, Doctor. We'd better wake him up. Prod, please, nurse. Ah! Oh! Ah! Mr. Tremlett? Yeah? Uh, sorry to disturb you, ah! but you're just a bit iller than your initial diagnosis. Give it to me straight. How much have I got to pay? Um, 95 pounds plus VAT. 111 pounds 62? Can I talk to my wife about this? Of course. Wife, please, nurse. What the hell's going on? Uh, Trixie, the doctor just needs to do a little bit more operation on me. No way, we can't afford that. It's only another hundred quid. No, Miguel, we promised me and the kids a holiday this year. I'm not letting us down again. Mrs Tremlett, as your husband's doctor, I really must advise you to reconsider. Dr Chang, let's cut to the chase. Will he die if he doesn't have the rest of his operation? Not immediately. That means no. Right, this is what we're going to do. There's 20 quid in coins. Do as much operation as you can with that. I'll stitch him up myself on the sewing machine at home. It can't be that hard. I don't like the sound of that, darling. I've made our decision, Miguel. I'll wait in the car. Doc, what would 20 quid get me? <sighs> Blast on the defib. Deal. I've always wanted to go on that as it goes. Clear. Oh, yeah. Worth every penny. Here's another 20. Don't tell the wife. Oh, yeah. Oscar, allowing the public to choose what their tax is spent on is like hurdling into a line enclosure dressed as a pantomime antelope. You will instantly regret it. What we should do instead is market the Inland Revenue as the vital charity organisation that it essentially is. Face it, if you've got an expensive accountant, paying any tax is fundamentally a voluntary act of philanthropy. Bleak point, but good point. Big business's self-diagnosed allergy to tax costs the British public tens of billions of pounds a year. Yep. Penalties for corporate tax evasion are currently an MBE, or in particularly severe cases, a knighthood and behind-the-scenes influence with the cabinet. Look, however you raise tax, the public are still going to carp on about how they're old enough and British enough to look after themselves and they don't need a nanny state. Anyway, even if it is a nanny state, it's hardly Mary Turding Poppins, is it? Really, Oscar? It's just that they've spoon-fed us so much sugar to make the Iraq war go down that Britain's now developed weapons-grade diabetes. I'm onto this, guys. I've had the department's mega-crash investigate the most appropriate level of nanification with which the British state should coddle its citizens. We can breeze by there after lunch. Great! It's Alpine lunch today in the department's snowdrome. They're testing the effect of altitude on productivity. Altitude? It was supposed to be attitude, but it looks like Blind Terry's new proofreading dog is going to need a bit more training. I'll grab my goggles. I'll wax your snowboard for you, Oscar. Attention, Attention department, department employees. employees. The Department, department Internal, Internal Dispute Resolution Court is delighted to announce a settlement between the Optimism and Pessimism divisions with regard to the glass half full, glass half empty debate. Both sides now concur that the glass is indeed half full of piss. Ah, oh, this is the life. Oscar, you look pretty queasy. Yeah, well, ski lifts, Laszlo, are a blatant contravention of God's holy law of gravity. Let's jump off. <laughs> Use two legs, Oscar. <clears throat> Hello, Team 32. Keith, I didn't know you could yodel. Grade 8 merit. Would have been distinction, but I overfunked the middle eight and the examiner was a traditionalist. Where's my lunch? You've got to earn it, Victor, by working productively as a team. If you lot can get to the bottom of this mountain efficiently, then lunch will be yours to lunch on. All right, what's the quickest way down then? Bob sled, no contest. The four-man Bob is the most efficient way of getting from A to B, provided that A is at the top of a mountain and B is at the bottom. And there is a bobsled run between A and B. But there's only three of us, Keith. I'm a qualified brakeman. Oscar, you be pilot. Uh, all right. Victor, Laszlo, yep. get us away quickly and then keep low. No right. problem. Let's go. One, two, three. Oh! Oh! In now! Oh, go 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 that was my leg. Oh, it is my leg. Oh. Keith, this lunch has better be worth it. Adequate start. And let me remind you... Oh! If you fail to achieve your target in 250% productivity height... Oh! Oh! The department committee will take any necessary measures... Oh! ...to shunt your workshop and behind towards respectability. Oh! Brakes on! Oh! Good finish! Oh, disappointing time. Oh. You went too high on the third bend, Oscar. Oscar! Idiot. Disappointing. Jürgen, these three guys are on the lunch blacklist. I'll take the Von Trapp omelette with a side avalanche of beans. 
Well, Oscar, looks like you've just herminated our lunch into the side of a tree. Come on, then. Let's get down to the mega crash and see if they've managed to whip up that nanny steak cocktail. Shoes off. Now we've got two nanny steak prototypes to test on you from either end of the social security spectrum. Hop into the playpen, lads. Hey, this rocking horse is realistic. That's a real horse, Victor. It's just emotionally disturbed. That would explain the long face. Now, the first state nanny's been developed by the department's liberal caremongering brigade. X! Yeah? Activate smothering Betty! Don't do that! Don't do that! Victor, take that thumb out of your mouth. It might be poisonous. I'll legislate if I have to. I'll see you in court. Oscar, don't read that book. It might influence you. Oh, sorry, nanny. Victor, don't throw that horse at Oscar. Let me live my own life! Laszlo, turn this overprotective bitch off! She's only guilty of caring too much, Victor. Turn it off, Felix! Right, Joe! Don't do that! The second nanny was constructed by the On Your Bikers in the department laissez-faire workshop. Brace yourselves. Activate unqualified agency, Bridget! I wish your parents had never had John. You're never a man to nut me. Victor, play with this spike. Oh, all right. Ow! Ow! Help! I've impaled myself on a spike! Look after yourself, you little oh. shit. Uh, Nanny, ah. can you help me with Kiss my... Oh. <laughs> oh, no, make the anarchy stop, Laszlo. Can it, Felix? Roger! On your bike! On your bike! Oh, I preferred the first one. At least she made me feel safe. Oh, can we not develop something in between the two? We tried, but it wasn't a vote winner, so we sold it to the Canadians. Oh, well. Laszlo, help Victor off his spike and let's get back to the office. With pleasure. Ah! Uh, uh. Ooh, slipped out a treat. Attention, Attention department employees. employees. The, the simplistic, simplistic philosophy division's equation recalculation, recalculation unit have, have discovered, discovered that tragedy, tragedy plus time, in fact, fact equals autobiography. Plus film deal, divided, divided by, by loss of privacy. Stop bleeding, Victor. We simply don't have time. I'll staunch it with my blowtorch. Ah! We have to finish our brief and increase our productivity by 250% or we're going to be playing the ugly beanstalk in whatever performance-enhancing pantomime Keith has assistant produced for us. Don't worry, Oscar. I've outsourced our problem. I've commissioned an extra two and a half reports for us from the kids in the department sweatshop. Really? Will they be any good? Yeah, we'll lose a bit of quality, but by the time they inevitably fall apart, we should be in the clear. Sold. Right, back to work. Now, the brief wants us to look at benefit fraud. Clearly, the current methods of dissuading people from swizzing the state are not just missing the treble 20, they're missing the board and skewering the barman in the eye. Well, that's because it's as easy as taking babies from a candy shop. I'm currently registered unemployed in over 190 countries. It's technically true. It is morally reprehensible. Who are you angry with? Me or the system? Well, neither of you is getting a Christmas card. Well, once again, we can enlist outside help. Learn from the Mafia. For all their arguable shortcomings as upstanding members of Italian society, they are black belt grandmasters in the art of persuasion. Ooh, good idea. Let's start by unleashing them on incapacity benefit fraudsters. State-run goons would finally ensure that those chances are genuinely eligible for the free wedge they are so bogusly claiming. Hello, Mr Stapleton. Ah, who are you and how'd you get into my shed? We're from the benefits office. Mr Stapleton, we got pictures here of you winning your village fate egg and spoon race. That's an impressive winning margin for someone who is, let me quote, incapable of work due to physical impairment. Clap him, Salvatore. I have good days and bad days. What a shame you couldn't find any work carrying eggs on a spoon. Look, I'll go back to work, honest. Too late, senor slacko. You've been swiping money off the Queen and now you are going to pay for it. What are you going to do to me? Either you get back to work by the time Salvatore's cooked as a carbonara. You'll have to be quick. I like my pasta al dente. Or we will assist you towards becoming genuinely entitled to your incapacity benefit by firing this at that Ooh. and by using these on those. So what's it to be, Mr Stapleton? Oh, I'll keep the benefits. I can't face going back to work. I just can't stand the small talk. Good decision. Could you at least give me an anaesthetic first? Do the honours, Toto. Oh! Help yourself to tea and coffee. Now, Luigi, would you like the parmesan in or on? Well, that'll sort out the real chaff from the bogus chaff. It won't be that easy, Oscar. 
Benefit blagging has been part of our battered ethical furniture ever since Lazarus's wife continued to claim widow's benefit for five years after his inconvenient resurrection. Besides, it's oversimplistic to accuse a handful of fraudsters of being responsible for the fact that the welfare state carved the choicest streaks of bacon out of the public piggy bank. Correct. For that, the severed finger of blame really has to land in a blood-splattered envelope on the doormat of our nation's old people. Well said. We are facing a pensions time bomb in Britain. And even more worryingly, North Korea have also developed the pensions time bomb and have been parading it around the streets of Pyongyang. And yet, the persistently itchy truth is that individually and collectively, we are not saving enough to see us through our long, slow decline towards heaven. That, Oscar, is because pensions companies have developed the un- edifying habit of proudly presenting retiring policyholders with steaming piles of shit instead of the pensions they were promised. Understandably, therefore, people are taking the government's advice to save not only with an enormous pinch of salt, but also with a wedge of lemon, before slamming the advice back so fast they can't taste it, whacking the glass on their head, collapsing in a heap, and not remembering it when they wake up the next day in the middle of a roundabout. How about harnessing the spoon-bending power of television? It's the one remaining master the public still sits up, begs and rolls over for. It's time it became a force for social good, instead of just a cultural anaesthetic. Yep, we can use goggle box game shows to ram home to people the risks of spending in their tangible present instead of saving up for an admittedly hypothetical future. So, Margaret and Rico, you've both managed to reach pensionable age. Well done, you. Thanks, Jimmy. It's Mr. Carr. Say sorry, Rico. Sorry, Mr. Carr. Now, you've got your basic state pension. For what it's worth, that is yours to keep, if you choose to. Because Rico and Margaret, you must now decide... Do you play it safe and take that basic subsistence allowance? Or do you gamble that pitiful excuse for a nest egg by opening the box of destiny? Ooh, I don't know. Uh, what do you think, Margaret? Well, we do need something for our final years, especially as we don't believe in God. That's a good point. Remember, the box of destiny could contain anything from a Jimmy Carr quadruple pension for two to a Jimmy Carr hot water bottle and signed good luck photo. In your own time... It looks like Margaret and Rico are starting to regret spending all that money on family holidays and their ex-dog Wesley. They must be wondering how on earth both they and their government were short-sighted enough to land themselves in such an intractable financial mess. Your final decision, please. Well, Mr Carr, it's been a difficult choice. Yeah, with hindsight, we wish we hadn't had any of our three lovely children. So, we're going to have to gamble on the box of destiny? We've got practically nothing to lose. OK, Rico. Margaret, I will now open the box of destiny. Oh, bad luck, it's absolutely nothing. Oh, no! We're in real trouble now. Oh, you're blaming me now, are you? Anyway, you've had a lovely day. Oh, not really. It's been the stuff of ageing nightmares. That wasn't a question. You've had a lovely day. We'll be back after the break to stare into the abyss of retirement with two more desperate 65-year-olds. See you in five. Well, that might help, but you're still left locked in a smooching slow dance with an unmentionable Medusa. The literally petrifying fact is that there are too many old people nowadays, and they're staying not dead for longer and longer. Yeah, old people should make more of an effort to integrate with mainstream British society, or they should go straight back to where they came from. The 1940s. Yeah, there ain't no grey in the Union Jack! Settle down, you two. Clearly, we need to introduce Codger quotas. Cracking idea. Can we not reach some kind of deal whereby the state guarantees our health and well-being up until the age of 80 on the strict condition that on our 80th birthday we kill ourselves? I think most people under the age of 79 would sign something to that effect. And you could even choose exactly how you want to peg out. Well, Mabel and I would like to thank you all for coming today to watch us die the way we would have wanted to go, driving off the edge of a cliff into a disused limestone quarry. Yes, the, the, the last few years have been very tricky for us. It's difficult getting older and watching your friends slowly choose to be eaten by tigers, sabotage their own parachute jumps and eat undercooked chicken. Yes, but we've had a great life. Oh, yes, we have. We can't complain. No, and before we go, we'd just like to announce that we're going to be leaving all of our worldly passions to Huntington Life Sciences. What? Mum, you are joking! Oh, come off it, Alan. You know how much we both hate cats. 
Yeah, never like the furry little half wit. We funded your money for the kids' new apiary, you old witties! Floor it, Gladys! Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. Give me my car back! Brilliant! Attendance at funerals will rock it, and the state won't whittle away its money on preserving people through an interminable and pointless retirement. No, that's good thinking. Well, we're done. Laszlo, uh, have you got the extra reports from our hard-working saviours in the sweatshop? Yep. I've even scrubbed the bloodstains off them. Right, well, put the three and a half discs up the chute. And I think we've earned ourselves a celebration. Yay! Laszlo, over to you. Seems ready to finish the work. That'll be Keith to congratulate us. Victor Gooch, allergy to cats. Victor! Team 32, proud? Proud? You shouldn't be. You're a disgrace! Well, did, did you not get our three and a half reports? Yes, I've got them here. One of them is adequate. The other two and a half seem to be in Indonesia. Oh, Laszlo. Luckily, Laszlo, I smelt this rat before you even started cooking it. That sweatshop is for the exclusive use of the Department Affordable Fashion Unit. So, discounting your ineligible reports, your productivity level is unchanged at... Not good enough! This is your fault, Laszlo. Meet me in ten minutes in the Employee Improvement Hutch. Oh, nice work, Laszlo. Yeah, way to knuckle down, knuckle face. Hello, Team 32. Laszlo, prepare to undergo a procedure that will statistically make you more responsible and, yes, more productive. Keith, this place looks like a chapel. It has been scientifically proven by both science and sportsmen that people work far harder with the overhanging burden of a wife and family to support and impress. Therefore, Laszlo, you are to be compulsorily married. I'm to be what? Congratulations! Who, who am I marrying? It, it's Wendy, isn't it? Is it Wendy? I knew we were destined for each other ever since I had that dream about her every night for the last eight years. No, Laszlo, it's not Wendy. I'll give you a clue. Why do you think I am wearing this frilly white dress? Oh, no. I'm so happy for you, Laszlo. Oh, I love wedding. Oscar, chuck these robes on. You can MC this gig. I'd love to. Keith, this has to remain a strictly professional arrangement. Give it time, Laszlo. Don't ruin my special day. <clears throat> I do. <laughs> Just warming up. Congratulations, both of you. And uh, wasn't it part of the deal that you two have to have children as well? Congratulations again. We've already had one, Victor. It's you. What? We've adopted you. Your productivity figures were almost subhuman. You need some hardcore parental discipline. Laszlo, you've ruined both of our lives. Don't talk to your father like that! Ow! Steady on, Keith. He's only small. Don't undermine me in front of the boy! Ah. Jump to it, Oscar. <clears throat> Dearly beloved... The Department was written and performed by John Oliver and Andy Zaltzman and featured Chris Addison with Peter Dixon, Matthew Holness and Lucy Montgomery. Jimmy Carr rode into the studio on a horse and rode out on a rhino. Enough said. Produced by Richard Grocock. The Department is an Avalon production for BBC Radio 4. Now, put your ears in the recovery position and kiss your radio goodbye.